Hey friends, this is Bailey. Welcome back to my channel. I haven't done a wrap up in a really, really long time. Really long time. This is my August wrap up. And it's because I have really good books to talk about and I didn't want it to just be a roast. I got one comment, I should have saved it. I deleted it right away just because, you know, that's what I do, but it was like, Man, you have horrible taste in books and it would suck to be you. Yikes. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and that was on one of like, my book roasts. So I'm just like thankful that I don't have another book roast today so that, you know, I don't offend people for having different opinions. I also had someone recently say that uh, they felt bad for me because the sun was in my eyes in a lot of my videos recently and it's like, I purposely have have it like this. I like it like this. Like, I have a whole, a whole apartment. If I didn't want the sun to be in my eyes, I would be somewhere else. Just saying. I like the sun. I'm a sun worshiper. I'm not a moon person. But you didn't know that about me. All right, so let's go over what I read. There was the book of Lilith. The Book of Lilith. I'm, I'm looking at my Goodreads because I kind of forget. It's been a really crazy month. The Book of Lilith by Barbara Black Koltov, a PhD. This is a small little book, but you will see I have it tabbed and marked out of the wazoo. It was first written in, please, please, please find this, 1986. It's only 122 pages. The main sources for this book are the Zohar, the Babylonian Talmud, the Jerusalem Bible, the Holy Scriptures according to Masoretic text, Masoretic text, uh, Louis Ginsburg, The Legends of the Jews, seven volumes, Raphael Patai, Gates to the Old City, and The Hebrew Goddess by, uh, I think it's a Katav publishing house. And then there's a ton of other works that are published, Margaret Atwood, um, Diane Fortune. There's a ton of Jung quotes in here. So she has Jung quoted. She also has a lot of um, rabbis quoted so rabbis have been like if they have published work they're quoted in here um yeah so it's an acad it's a work of academic it's a academic work and sorry i just filmed my sylvia plath vlog like the completion of it which is on patreon join my patreon if you want to see it because it's not going to be on here because it's it's like really, really emotional. I should have said that at the beginning. I have a Patreon, it's new, it's called The Fifth Dimension. Join it, you're gonna have access to a Discord. There's three different tiers. You could be in a book club too, which would be fun. Uh, I only have one person in the book club so far, um, which is fine, but like we could have more. And yeah, I'm posting my vlogs to Patreon because they have more personal experiences involved and uh, I have had, um, I mentioned in another video that I have had experience with stalkers and a narcissistic ex who likes to stalk too. So Patreon here, there it is. Back to the Book of Lilith. Loved it. Now, one of the things that I wanted to bring up, so this was five stars. There's, n there's no four and a half stars about this. This is five stars. One of the things I wanted to bring up about it was that her origins, Lilith's origins, are so interesting. And it's not just the story of um, being in the garden and not wanting to be subservient to Adam. You know, that's like the typical story that you're told about her origins. It was actually that she was the moon and glowed just as brightly as the sun and then asked the sun some questions about like switching like i want to see what's happening during the day and blah 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 and god was like mm, 
Nope. Now you now you have no light and you only have light if man, sun, shines it upon you. It was extremely relatable as I was experiencing this relationship where the the man actually referred to himself as like he said to me i am the sun and everyone else revolves around me and there are multiple times within this book where she says stuff about or she quotes jung jung talked about how um god if i can remember it correctly how men typically go on the hero's journey with honor heroism so they have their knapsack and they have their sword and they have the like village cheering them on and they have all the support whereas women are typically like extricated from community or um aren't believed or aren't seen and they have to go on an internal journey and that's where deep in their psyche they meet Lilith so they meet the suppressed wild woman it's so cool and Jung definitely like let me look at the, the bibliography if you're interested in this because I actually watched a documentary about the woman that Jung interviewed um and then later published uh the visions seminars so he actually worked with a woman for like 20 years and came up with all of these theories and they're in the vision seminars this woman was incredible there's a documentary about her on youtube and she built like a tower and she did wood carving and stuff maybe i'll link it below for you i loved it i also associated lilith a lot with um black moon lilith like i'm in thinking about like astrology so if you're into astrology i would highly recommend this book also if you're into sylvia plath and i'll tell you why here and here in a sec so i finished this in august but i started it like a while ago i reread it i reread it twice that's how good it was i read the goblin market a tale of two sisters by christina rossetti I gave it three stars. I read, I don't know why I gave it such a low rating. It wasn't like, I feel like if I had conversations with people about it, maybe the rating would go higher. Like if I was in a classroom setting, now see, now there's no sun. Leave me alone, you guys. Let me do my thing. Um, if I was in a classroom setting, completely analyzing the goblin market, I think I would have given it a higher rating. I really like the idea that if you come across a whole bunch of like little goblins giving you like fruit and vegetables, stay flipping far away. It's very like fey folklore. And then, but it's like two sisters and I want to... I want to do further research into seeing if there were like lesbian undertones because they, they didn't seem like sisters. I'm an only child, so if if you have long kisses with your sister and and that's normal, feel free to let me know because I don't know what I'm talking about as an only child. The other book I read was for my um, if you liked Midsummer, folk horror book recommendations this book was in there go check it out I'll put it in the cards I'll put it down below it's called Wilding Hall by Elizabeth Hand this was first published in let's see I actually listened to this and I'm really glad I did it was first published in 2015 again I know that there's like weirdness about audiobooks but I work full-time and I garden and it's either that or like a Rick Rubin podcast. And I'm frankly over some of Rick Rubin's podcasts. So tell me what else I'm supposed to be listening to. The synopsis says, when the young members of a British acid folk band are compelled by their manager to record their, their unique music, they hole up at Wilding Hall, an ancient country house with dark secrets. 
There they create the album that will make their reputation, but at a terrifying cost. Julian Blake, the group's lead singer, disappears within the mansion and is never seen or heard from again. Now, years later, the surviving musicians, along with their friends and lovers, including a psychic, a photographer, and the band's manager, meet with the young documentary filmmaker to tell their versions of what happened that summer, but whose story is true, and what really happened to Julian Blake. This was published before Daisy Jones and the Six, but it's the same format. So it's all of these people telling the documentarian, like, well, I think that so-and-so had a secret relationship, or yeah, that day was really weird, blah, blah, blah. But there's gothic elements, like the synopsis said, but there's definitely folk horror in there because there's fey lore that's um, very specific to this region of England. So it was really neat. I gave it four stars. I thought that what it was doing, so like, because it was before Daisy Jones and the Six, and you know, now Daisy Jones and the Six has that reputation of being in that format, but this this format came before that, or this book came before that. So I thought like that was cool that that Wild or Elizabeth Han experimented with with that format. I also thought it was really cool the amount of research that she did that I didn't really. Okay, sorry, I'm going off on a tangent. I went down a deep Reddit hole after reading this because I was like, what the fuck just happened? Like, what what just happened? I'm really good at following books. This was only 106 pages. And then my mind blew up. I was like, whoa, she did such a good job. Whoa. Kind of like, um... I could compare it to Mary Shelley's Haunting of Hill House in that you're, once you like sit with it and once you like have conversations with other people, you're, you're, you're like, whoa, this book was even better than I imagined kind of thing. So that was, that was that. I don't know why I'm being so dramatic right now. Okay, a DNF is Cunning Folk by Adam Neville. I wanted to read this for the folk horror vlog, however, it was just automatically too in your face with evilness. Maybe at some point I'll read it, but the synopsis says, money's tight and their new home is a fixer upper deep in rural Southwest England with an ancient wood at the front of the garden. Tom and his family are miles from anywhere and anyone familiar. His wife Fiona was never convinced that buying the money pit out of the auction was a good idea, not least because the previous owner committed suicide, though no one can explain why. And so they move out into the middle of nowhere and their neighbors are really, really weird. And it was just like too, too much. Their neighbors were weird right away and already super mean right away. And it was very much, it reminded me of like, if you liked Salem's a lot, if you liked the writing style of that, you could definitely like Cunning Folk. Um, what's another book that it reminded me of that's too, that was like, right in your face uh southern vampires guide whatever that that book is what's that guy's name i forget uh, let me let me help you guys don't worry about me i got burnt from kayaking recently i'll be fine okay if you don't want to in your face but you're still interested in folk horror cunning folk wouldn't be it i would suggest harvest home i think cunning folk might be really really inspired by harvest home also i heard that adam neville has a book called the ritual and the ritual is like the one of the number one folk horror books slash movies so, i mean give it a don't just listen to me about everything. Discern for yourself. This was published uh, 2021. DNF. Maybe come back to, maybe not. I got plenty of other things. Then I read The Lottery and Seven Other Short Stories by Shirley Jackson. I am trying to prepare for Gothlet November with my friend Rachel. So Shirley Jackson, I'm spoiler alert, I'm going to be reading her. But I also wanted to see 
what's gothic and what's folk horror because there is an overlap and then especially with Shirley Jackson there's an overlap so I read The Lottery and seven other short stories I gave it two stars and I only gave it two stars for The Lottery <laughs> uh that's not true um the lottery i gave four stars to it's that's a good short story it just is it's about a, a a small village who has an annual ritual and names are being pulled out of a box and that's where i'll leave it it's freaky i gave two stars to her short story in there called flower garden and that's i gave two stars because of when Shirley Jackson was alive and when she was publishing to be so against racism in something that's going to be published, especially being in a small rural town is very, very brave. And so sometimes I like to take that context in and sometimes that does change how I rate something because Shirley Jackson was extremely brave for what she was writing about. Um, Flower Garden is about just straight up racism. It was a stupid story so it would have been a one star if the um, calling out of small town racism wasn't there. I gave it two stars. Come Dance With Me in Ireland, one star. I don't even remember what that's about. Men With Their Big Shoes, don't even remember, one star. Trial by Combat, don't even remember, one star. Pillar of Salt, don't even remember, one star. So, I never have a good time with a collection of short stories. Just never. Uh, I love, uh, again, I love the lottery, so I'm just gonna stick with stuff like that. I'm thinking about reading not to spoil anything, but for Gothlet November, I'm thinking about reading Hangs a Man by Shirley Jackson. So if you have read that, or if you suggest something different, please let me know in the comments below. Hangs a Man was really interesting to me because I just watched the movie about Shirley Jackson. It's pretty fictionalized, but it still gave me that like, huh, I wanna read Hangs a Man feeling. I've already read Haunting of Hill House, that's one of my favorites, so cool. Let's move to more of my physical copies that I didn't, I did not listen to on audio at work. Still too, okay, that's a good balance. This is my third reread of Mary Magdalene Revealed, The First Apostle, Her Feminist Gospel, and the Christianity We Haven't Tried Yet by Megan Watterson. Megan Watterson is a theologian. I have said this so many times because I now have a TikTok where I talk about the Gospels of Mary Magdalene. I have uploaded them to this YouTube channel. They are the least viewed videos I have ever had in my whole life. The Gospels of Mary Magdalene turn Christianity on its head. It's basically, okay. The canonized Bible in history, if you look at the Bible as a work of art, as a book, there were tons of other books that were written and produced around the same time that were considered Christian, that did not make the cut by a couple of councils. The councils were like 10 to 12 men. There weren't even a lot of people. And uh, the Gospels of Mary Magdalene did not make the cut and they were also hidden. There's three copies. They were um, hidden in multiple places with the same missing pages. And they're all, I believe all three are in Coptic, which means that the Greeks translated from the Egyptians or vice versa. I forget. If you are, if you have religious trauma, if you are very anti-Christian, if you are um, trying to have more, I don't know, balance with feminism within your spiritual practice, or even with um, seeing Jesus in a new light, I don't know, dude. I, I think everyone should pick this up. 
I'm like, you don't have to believe it. Just read another perspective and get to know what like Gnosticism is because Gnosticism is also kind of important in understanding the history around this. But if you're interested in this at all, go and check my playlist that's called Esoteric and I'm reading the Gospels with you. So I'm not reading them from a place of being a believer. I'm not giving sermons. I am just simply like reading along and looking at it as a book. I In high school, I read the Bible as a book. It was called Biblical Literature. And when I went to college, I read the Bible as literature um, for one class. I took another class about the history of the Old Testament. I took a class about women in the Bible. I have read the Bible front to back many times and I'm still not like a Christian. Like you're not gonna like get brainwashed by reading someone else's perspective, okay? Yeah. Sassy pants today. Uh, let me start with this one. So for my Sylvia Plath vlog that's only on Patreon, I went down to the Lily Library and I reserved eight books from her estate and I smelled Sylvia Plath, I touched a whole bunch of her stuff, I read a ton of unpublished poems, I mean they still have the stuff all on hold for me still, I just got completely overwhelmed and couldn't do it. Um, part of that vlog was me reading three of her works and you know, um, also I'm coming out of a narcissistic abusive relationship and I wanted to keep a lot of that private so that's again why it's on Patreon but I didn't realize how much Sylvia Plath was like not only helping me while I was in the relationship but helping me through the recovery process which I will still be in for a while so it was a very yeah it's been a it's been an interesting couple months with me and Sylvia we've we've gone through it so mary ventura in the ninth kingdom is a short novella that she wrote while she was in smith college in 1952 and mary ventura is actually one of her friends when she was growing up but it's a fictional character in this in this little novella and she gets on this train her parents basically force her she says i'm not ready and she gets on this train and she sits next to this old woman who's knitting and they keep talking back and forth and they're passing certain stops and it's pretty existential. It's not just her being on a train. It's like a huge metaphor for something else. Okay. And I, I love it. I love it. I have, I have a whole bunch of places marked up that I've got to do some note taking. That video is coming soon where I tell you how I do note taking and why. This is a story essentially about uh, the hunger for life and the thirst for life and the desire to take your own course in life. Okay. The Unabridged Journals of Sylvia Plath. Look at this whopper. I stopped halfway. I stopped at page 306. And that is because when I went down to Sylvia Plath's stuff and the estate and the eight boxes, I read the last five letters she sent her mom before she committed suicide. And um, it's a little too heavy for me to read her journals right now. I just have to stop. Uh, I'm gonna have a part two to that vlog. So I will be reading the second part of her journals. I'll be reading Colossus, her other collection of poetry. I'll also be reading The Occult and Sylvia Plath in that second part. So it's gonna happen. I'm gonna finish it. Um, we are at a place where Ted Hughes is cheating on her and we are at a place where she is kind of unhappy right now. And because I have just held her baby book, because I have just seen photos of her as a child and photos of her playing with her children. And I just can't go down that road, road right now. This is too intimate, it's too personal. So if you're interested again, check out the Patreon. Lastly, Sylvia Plath's 
Ariel, the collection that Frida Hughes, her daughter, actually, um, so Ted Hughes released Ariel in the ways that he wanted to. He took out poems, like 10 poems in the US and 13 in the UK and rearranged them and stuff. Uh, this is the exact layout that Sylvia Plath wanted for her collection of poems. This one right here. And the foreword by Frida Hughes explains all of that. And also Ariel is the collection of poems that um, most of the poems were mainly written like five weeks before she committed suicide. So they are just like passionate, raw. Um, she is like, she's going, she's going for it. There's no one stopping her from speaking her truth and it's some of her best work. If you know Daddy, Daddy's in here. Lady Lazarus, uh, Tulips, which I read um, in a different video if you wanna go and check that one out. The Jailer was one of my favorites. That's definitely gotta do with narcissistic abuse. Ariel is another favorite. Um, maybe I'll read more of her, maybe I'll read more of her poetry on here, but and Lady Lazarus, which is like one of her most famous poems, she says in a stanza, I'm not going to read you the whole thing. She says, dying is an art. Like everything else, I do it exceptionally well. I do it so it feels like hell. I do it so it feels real. I guess you could say I have a call. Now tell me what her sun sign is after that. It's easy. So five stars for our five stars for literally everything Sylvia Plath. Five stars. Five stars. Five stars. Five stars. Cool. It was a good month. I'm excited for next month. It's straight up folk horror, and I'm borrowing a couple books. I'm taking a class about uh, the goddesses of the ancient Welsh text called the Mabinogi by Chris Hughes, who's on YouTube. I will link her below. I'm really, really excited for that. So we do have to read the Mabinogi for that, which is kind of difficult to read. But Chris Hughes is just like, oh my God, a wealth of information. You should subscribe to that channel ASAP. What else? So full core, Mabinogi, um, asteroids as goddesses. I'll give you my TBR here soon. How about that? So this is just my wrap up. All right, let me know what you read. Let me know if you liked any of these books and I will talk to you all soon. Thanks for being here.